Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Central Banking Objective 1. Audit the Federal Reserve. Suppose there is an audit of the Federal Reserve. What audit standard would apply to an entity as unique as the Federal Reserve? So, first, a standard would have to be developed to assure that the audit provided the desired results. I would suggest that this would first be given to the Treasury Department to propose the standard. I can see Treasury taking uh, a year or two to develop their proposal for a standard. Then, it would go to the Congress, who would assign it to committee, and it would be in congressional committees for at least two years. Once the standard was determined, the audit would be conducted. Most assuredly, at least some of the auditors would be people well-versed in the practices and procedures of the Federal Reserve. Even if the audit is ever completed, it would show massive fraud. The result would be to enact laws to prohibit that sort of fraud in the future, and at best, begin the process of looking for an alternative to the Federal Reserve Act. The problem is that Congress was outside of its authority when it enacted the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. The effect of the subsequent years of entrenchment, loss of gold and silver as a means of paying debt, and the enormous debt that has been created and mostly owed to the Federal Reserve makes a solution under the present system almost impossible. The Congress has failed to adhere to the Constitution. Objective 2. End the Federal Reserve. Even if ended abruptly, the effect on the economy, especially with regard to the national debt, would be devastating. What alternative to both dealing with circulating currency and payment of debt would be implemented to avoid such disaster? The problem is that the Congress abrogated their responsibility under the Constitution and allowed an administrative agency, the Treasury Department, and a private group of investors to control our economy. Objective 3. Ron Paul. Ron Paul has come along and captured the hearts of many of those who believe that the rebel U.S. government has gone astray. He is right in much of what he says, and those who have adhered themselves to him are also right in doing so. However, we must think also of what effect it would have if Ron Paul were elected president. What would change? The president cannot act without the consent of the Congress. If he does, he places himself in a position to be censured or overruled by the Congress. He has a multitude of administrative agencies to deal with, over 1,000, and most of them have already developed a mind of their own. Alone, or even with as many as 100 members of Congress on his side, 
the changes on the nature of government and the power of the political elite is such that there would be no substantial change in the operation of the government. The problem is that the nature of government has changed to the point that return to the confines of the limitations imposed by the Constitution is nearly impossible. Separation of powers has become ineffective because of the power of the political parties and the political elite. In reviewing these issues and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it. Each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100%, not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually, to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed. When that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms, or defeat by failure 
to be willing to fully commit to the cause.